it's a very important point for us to investigate as to why did African Americans get into this business of convincing Dalits that they are fellow blacks and they are fellow blacks and then these Aryans and all that are whites who have been enslaving them. How did this happen? In this episode, my main purpose is to show you that until say the mid late 60s, until that recently, African Americans were very close to Indians, very close to Hindus. They supported us during the, uh, the uh, independence movement. They, they really understood us, we supported them and, and so on. Lala Lajpat Rai, Mohandas Gandhi, various other people had very good friendships with, with African Americans. Martin Luther King, his mentor, Professor Thurman, they were very close to India and Ga not only Gandhi but the whole culture of India. So how did that era of you know, harmony and closeness between these two communities come to an end and lead to the current tension because of this artificial fabricated Afro-Dalit identity that has been hoisted. So to do this, I'm going to have a conversation with Shefali. Namaste. I'm continuing my discussion with Shifali Chandan, who's a scholar and a colleague. He's worked with me for a long time. And the episode we're going to do now is about African Americans and their relationships with Indians and especially Hindus. Many years ago, I was invited by NBC, Rockefeller Center, New York, to come and participate in a discussion during Black History Month. Uh, we were going to talk about uh, the relationships between the African American civil rights movement, uh, people like uh, Reverend Martin Luther King and people in India like Mohandas Gandhi and various other nationalists and what, has, what that history meant and so on. So I'm going to show you a clip and then we'll discuss and uh, discuss the issues as to how things have changed since that time when the two communities were so close together to today when all kinds of things are happening with this Afro-Dalit movement and Afro-Dalit, this artificial fabrication that has come upon, uh, come to haunt us. So here's the clip. Welcome back. I'm Melissa Harris Perry. Christian theology was the touchstone for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s political ideology. But King's Christianity was neither narrow nor exclusive. It found common purpose throughout the world, most critically with Mahatma Gandhi, the anti-colonial activist and philosopher who led India to independence from Great Britain through non-violent direct action protest. After his 1959 trip to India, 11 years after Gandhi's assassination and 54 years ago this month, Dr. King wrote in the essay, My Trip to the Land of Gandhi, we were looked upon as brothers with the color of our skins as something of an asset. But the strongest bond of fraternity was the common cause of minority and colonial peoples in America, Africa and Asia, struggling to throw off racialism and imperialism. But it wasn't just a feeling of brotherhood and unified objectives. Dr. King experienced a real sense of purpose and strategy. Here's another passage from the essay. I left India more convinced than ever before that nonviolent resistance is the most potent weapon available to oppressed people in their struggle for freedom. Joining now to talk about this different type of black-brown coalition is Khalil Jabral Mohammed, director of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, also Matt Welch, editor-in-chief of Reason Magazine, Anthea Butler, religious studies professor at the University of Pennsylvania, and Rajiv Mahatra, who is the founder of Infinity Foundation. And the last time that you were here, told me that you were working on a book on exactly this topic of how African-American history and the story of India relate and interconnect with one another. Talk to me a little bit about that. Well, you know, Gandhi started his struggle in South Africa. Yep. He was based in South Africa. And his whole model was a Hindu model, and Martin Luther King's model was a Christian model, but both of them converged on the idea of nonviolence to resist against oppression. 
So one of the one of the interesting questions is what if this were applied today in the struggles today which have turned violent? Mm -hmm. What if nonviolence were used rather than violence today? In their respective struggles also, there were so many factions and so many pressures from other groups to make violence the method. And these two men were great enough to resist that. So I think there's a lesson from their common history. And also the African-American experience in this country has been very important in the, in the creation of non-white identities mm -hmm. as a kind of a opening door for others. The civil rights movement led to others be, uh, being able to migrate because the Immigration Act mm -hmm. followed soon after the Civil Rights Act, yeah. which is why most I Indian Americans like me are able to come here to this country. So uh, while the African Americans have very successfully created a new identity, mm -hmm. a positive identity, and not sort of confused about are we white or not, white but we are positive as to who we are I think Indian Americans are still new in this country and haven't sure. done that and there's still the Bobby Jindal syndrome which says well I'd rather be white mm. and then there is the other type who says well if I have enough money and I've made it materially then I don't need to worry about these issues mm -hmm. so the, the the real project of being distinct and being American at the same time in a multicultural setup is something that Indian Americans have yet to start in, in a serious way. I think another aspect which we shouldn't forget is besides the civil disobedience from a political level, there was also this decolonizing the intellectual epistemology. Mm -hmm. Gandhi wrote his a, a book called Hind Swaraj, which means the liberation, the freedom of his nation, yep. 100 years ago uh, in, uh, in 1909 or so. And that was his blueprint critiquing British system of thought, yep. British paradigm framework. And he was accusing his countrymen who were becoming soldiers for the British Army mm -hmm. and civil servants for the British Empire. And they were the ones who were firing bullets and, and enforcing all the British laws against Indians. So this is also an intellectual revolt. That's right. In, in, in popular culture, we like to say, free your mind, your behind will follow. Stay right there. We're going to stay on exactly this issue of how the struggle continues and how we all can be part of making progress. You know, my book, Breaking India, one of the major points it makes is that the so-called Dalits have been artificially forced to be given the identity of blacks. And this whole Afro-Dalit project has caused a lot of harm. Missionaries have played into this. Breaking India forces, leftists have played into this. So it's a very important point for us to investigate as to why did African-Americans get into this business of convincing Dalits that they are fellow blacks. And they are fellow blacks and then these Aryans and all that are whites who have been enslaving them. How did this happen? In this episode, my main purpose is to show you that until say the mid late 60s, until that recently, African Americans were very close to Indians, very close to Hindus. They supported us during the, uh, the uh, independence movement. They, they really understood us. We supported them and, and so on. Lala Lajpat Rai, Mohandas Gandhi, various other people had very good friendships with, with African Americans. Martin Luther King, his mentor, Professor Thurman, they were very close to India and not only Gandhi, but the whole culture of India. So how did that era of you know, harmony and closeness between these two communities come to an end and lead to the current tension because of this artificial fabricated Afro-Dalit identity that has been hoisted? So to do this, I'm going to have a conversation with Shefali. Welcome Shefali to the show. Thank you so much again, yeah. Rajiv. Thank you. Yeah. So we are going to talk about, mm. we'll start with when, the, when slavery was abolished right. because of the civil war, blacks became free. Mm -hmm. uh, so to, to give people a quick version, uh, when blacks became free, there was a period of uh, restoration, reconstruction. It was called the reconstruction era. Blacks got jobs. One of them became a senator. There was a lot of intermarriage. There was that kind of a harmony. Right. But it didn't last long because the white unions felt mm. that the blacks were taking too many jobs. So laws were enacted, which are called Jim Crow laws, right. to enforce segregation. That's right. This went on from the late 1800s to 1960s, Right. these Jim Crow laws. And so it's absolutely amazing how recently in American history, there was this official legal 
se uh, segregation of blacks and whites. That's correct. We'll talk about that. And then came the, uh, and then during this era, there was a huge amount of uh, camaraderie between our, us, our community, uh, Indians, uh, both here and in India, mm -hmm. and African Americans working together. They were helping us in our fight against the British for independence. And they were also very concerned about the role of missionaries in India at that time. Even though they were black Christians, but they were very concerned about the role of missionaries and how they were divisive in India and exploiting and so on. We will go through a lot of that evidence. And then the high point is this 1965 act which allows Indians to come and migrate. This was thanks to the African Americans. We will show you that it is they who opened the floodgates for non-whites to come to the United States because yes. until then there was prejudice. And so people like us are here thanks to the hard work and the sacrifice of blacks in this country. Yes. We have to acknowledge that. And the civil rights movement. And the yeah. civil rights movement mm -hmm. is part of that. So uh, then after that, things fell apart between the two communities. We'll talk about it. So that's the program today. Yes. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Rajiv. And you know, I just want to preface our conversation by saying that um, it's really in the interest of Indians in America to reach out to the African American community for all of the reasons that we're about to discuss, because they are true allies. The African American community voluntarily uh, reached out to Indians in the period that you just discussed, uh, really, and gave uh, Indians and India a big boost in the minds of Americans here, as well as a big boost to the Indian freedom struggle. So we owe a great deal to that community. The first thing we want to talk about is the Jim Crow laws. Yeah. Now these laws were enacted. Uh, tell us a little bit about your understanding of why they were enacted and what they did. Well, after the um, soon after the Reconstruction era, um, you know, once again, it was really white supremacy reasserting itself. Yes, you know, slavery had been abolished, but, um, you know, uh, there was no real interest to share power and opportunities with African Americans. And so there was a whole slew of laws that were introduced into the country all over in, in several states. They varied a little bit from state to state. And the, the purpose of the laws was really to segregate, to segregate African Americans from uh, uh, white, white people um, in, in, in a whole variety of ways. So education was segregated, uh, church was segregated. You know, a lot, one of it the- It still is. Um, the, the, uh, the segregation of Christian churches in the United States has been written about yeah. that this is the most segregated institution in America today, even after the schools have been, re, you know, desegregated and where jobs and you know, workplace due to laws being forced, uh, the church remains an absolutely segregated place. There's black churches, there's white churches, very, very few mixed congregations. African Americans in the South used to be Catholic, but uh, the Catholic Church didn't want blacks and whites attending mass at the same time. And in fact, uh, blacks, the whites were not supposed to look at blacks even as uh, they were coming into church and during mass. So the blacks had to wait and enter through another door in a place of worship. And that drove a whole lot of African Americans toward, um, you know, embracing uh, Protestant um, denominations and uh, becoming evangelical and no, whatnot. They didn't, they didn't in, uh, embrace the uh, mainstream Protestant in, uh, denominations, they created new ones. So this whole uh, charismatic churches, these black churches with the singing and you know, it's like, like Kirtan type of style. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, they, are, they are separate black churches. So they didn't join the original pure white churches, which remain white. Right, right. So, that's, so, so, so Protestantism allowed multiple churches. Correct. While the Catholics had one. Right. So if you wanted to break away, you, you get out of Catholicism and create your own Protestant church. That's right. And, mm -hmm. so, and this is also an interesting point. Indian Christians in this country have Indian churches where they don't worship with other people. In That's fact, right. In fact, the Keralites have the, separate from the Tamils mm -hmm. and the Telugus are separate. Yeah. There's a Punjabi Christian church. They're just Punjabis. So uh, the, the, the ethnic and racial divides yeah. that Christianity claims that they have, don't have 
In fact, they are scolding Indians for having all these problems. In fact, the Christian church is full of it. Yeah. So this is an important point. So the Jim Crow laws started. Yes. And they segregated bathrooms in, yes. in federal buildings, schools, uh, churches, burial grounds. burial grounds. So even when you're dead, you're segregated. Yeah. So all of this happened and uh, you're seeing some photographs of you know that kind of segregation on the screen. But if you were to Google, you'll see lots and lots of evidence of this, how it happened. Right. So despite the African Americans being oppressed under Jim Crow laws, and at the same time, people in India being ruled with a heavy-handed British, mm -hmm. they found ways of collaborating. Yes. So the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, launched in the United States by one Mr. White and one Mr. Du Bois, and some other founders uh, were in close collaboration with people like Lala Lajpat Rai from India. That's right. So I think this is a this is a fascinating story. Yes. Uh, of uh, how the uh, African American leaders really had sympathy for India and how they saw colonialism as part of the same problem as their own problem. That's absolutely right. So they really got it, those yes, guys. They really got they it. They did. For example, you know, uh, Walter White, who was the executive secretary of the NAACP, actually said so in so many words. And he said, you know, the struggle of the Negro in the United States is part and parcel of the struggle against imperialism and exploitation in India, China, Burma, Africa, the Philippines, etc. So not only him, but actually a very famous person was Mr. Du Bois. Yes. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. A very well-known uh, African-American leader yeah. and intellectual mm -hmm. scholar and so on and he was also one of the founders of this NAACP right. uh, along with White. So these two, both of them had a lot of sympathy and resonance with the Indian cause yeah. and I think Du Bois is the one who became very close to Lala Rajput Rai, there's a picture of them together. What Du Bois, uh, who was, as you said, the founder, one of the co-founders of the NAACP, reached out to Lala Lajpat Rai when the latter was in the U.S. Uh, during 19, between 1914 and 1919. And this is a very fascinating story. You know, Lala Lajpat Rai, who was such a nationalist uh, and well known in India, but had to leave India for a while and his stay extended to five years and he used that time very well. So his goal was to drum up support among Americans for Indian independence um, and he did that not by focusing only on uh, white Americans but he too understood that there was again that we had solidarity um, and we shared uh, a lot with African Americans and actively you know, reached out to them, Du Bois being one of them. They became close friends. They remained in touch. Du Bois opened a lot of doors for him. He introduced him to all sorts of people and covered the Indian independence, um, uh, the, the freedom struggle in his newspaper, The Crisis. What's interesting about Lala Lajpat Rai is that he understood very clearly on, upon reading some of the press about India here, he realized that you know we needed to have India needed to have Indian authored information and, and newspapers in America because he was aghast actually at some of the things that were being written about India and he allied with African Americans like Du Bois to present a more accurate picture of India of Hindus and of uh, what was going on there so um, as a nationalist and as a patriot he reached out to blacks and, and helped, got their assistance in presenting India in, in a positive light. He understood the importance of Indian authored information, started a magazine called Young India in America. He started the Indian Information, uh, India Information uh, League or uh, 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 the India Information House, I believe. Uh, in New York. So he did a lot. Lara Rajpatrai, he authored a book called The United States of America, A Hindu's Impression and a Study. Uh, he says Negroes are excluded from hotels, from YWCA's, YMCA's, theaters, salons, and even in white cemeteries. So even when they are dead, they cannot be buried there because it would violate local laws. The, the, there is a lot of public sentiment that keeps this going. 
this segregation going. So you cannot sort of surgically isolate some bad guys and say it's all their fault because this is what society wants. And Lala Rajpatra is very concerned about it. He was also appalled at the uh, ignorance in the United States about India's plight. And he writes, the civilized world's ignorance about India, her culture, her history, her politics and her economy is simply colossal. And sadly, you know, so much of that remains true even today. He was further uh, uh, upset that the misinformation Americans had about India was based on Americans being fed British colonial information. So whatever the British were thinking about India, and Indians, Americans were given that information. It bothered him quite a bit. So he realized that uh, Indo-American, which meant Indians, blacks, people in America who are sympathetic, need to author. They need to take over the discourse, like we are now trying to have Swadeshi ideology, so we take over the discourse. He felt that American blacks were good collaborators to author with Indians a new kind of discourse on India, which would be free from the colonial bias. So he launched a magazine uh, called Young India uh, uh, in the United States That's to, right. uh, to uh, give this sort of a point of view uh, with the help of uh, Du Bois and various other African-American collaborators. He also set up the Indian Information Bureau uh, uh, organization in the United States to supply this information to Americans from a more authentic Indian source. He certainly understood public relations. And it's also noteworthy that uh, Lala Lajpat Rai's stature in India is huge. He was one of, he's a leader of the Arya Samaj in right. India, a famous big nationalist protesting and you know all kinds mm -hmm. of activities he had yeah. against the British rule. Absolutely. So the importance of this on the the impact on Du Bois was huge. Uh, in fact, when India gained independence, Du Bois made an amazing statement to the effect that this 15th August is more significant than all the achievements of diversity and freedom from slavery and freedom from colonialism for the past 200 years. He goes on to saying, Rajiv, that this is saying a great deal when we remember that in the 19th century, Napoleon was overthrown, democracy established in England, Negro slaves emancipated in the United States, the German Empire founded, the partition of Africa determined upon, the Russian Revolution carried through, and two world wars fought. So the 19th and 20th centuries were very, very eventful. And in spite of that, he considers the 15th of August to be one of the greatest historical dates. Why? Because for on that date, 400 million colored folk of Asia were loosed. So the result of the Du Bois and uh, Lara Rajput Alliance and others like that was that uh, black uh, media, the newspapers, started covering India's independence struggle from an Indian point of view. And there are some very interesting quotes that uh, we should bring to your attention here. Here's um, a, a whole feature on Gandhi and India in the crisis, which is the magazine of the NAACP edited by Du Bois, dated March 1922. And he says, Behold a man who has ancient and great India at his feet, whom a powerful government is afraid to arrest, who causes visiting members of royalty to be snubbed, who threatens as a last resort to lead his people in an anti-tax paying crusade, thus striking at the very root of government, a man who professes to love his enemies and who refuses to take advantage or uh, of or embarrass a government in a crisis. And here is something called a democracy not for colored people. Uh, I won't give you the details, but basically it's making the same point that democracy is a kind of a sham in the sense that it's not meant for colored people, either in the United States or British controlled uh, territories and colonies. So that's what this newspaper article is saying. And on this, uh, this from the crisis September 1942, Again, you know, covering what's going on in India. Um, India's millions are exploited, starved and tax ridden to keep bright and gleaming and fabulous the biggest jewel in the crown of, of empire. So once again, informing the public here in America and their readership, of course, was mostly African-American, but informing that community um, 
you know, what was really going on. And this is in marked contrast, of course, to some of the coverage that we saw about Indians just a few decades earlier, if you remember, uh, in magazines like the San Francisco Call and the Chronicle and the Bellingham Herald. So there's a very different tone. Here is uh, uh, another black paper saying Gandhi's imprisonment protested by Harlemites. And it says, it reports that there was a large and enthusiastic crowd uh, which was present uh, when England was really being criticized by, uh, by the event uh, for its policies against uh, the people of India. So this is, the, this is how uh, enthusiastically the blacks supported uh, the Indian people against England. And here we have an article in the Chicago Defender which says Britain keeps India's natives in ignorance and then goes on to really explain, you know, the very dismal state of education in India under British rule. And this is another, uh, another sample newspaper uh, which says that uh, there was a meeting, a meeting sponsored, a Free India rally and it was sponsored by the Council on African Affairs. So the, Af the African Americans are really using their institutions because we Indians didn't have any in the United States. They've gotten more organized than we have. And so they are giving us access to those institutions to hold rallies, to get our point across. Now, in the midst of all this, Howard Thurman, a very, very powerful theologian, professor. He was a mentor later on for Martin Luther King Jr. This person begins a very important friendship with Mohandas Gandhi. He goes to India, leads a delegation of African Americans, goes with his wife, some amazing things happen there. So this is an important part of the story because this is the beginning of a kind of formalization and raising the African American and Indian collaboration to a new level because this is what brings Martin Luther King and all these people into the scene since Martin Luther King saw Thurman as his mentor. Uh, and in the next picture is a letter from Gandhi inviting them to India. Uh, the letter is really warm. It's a postcard that Gandhi sent to Thurman inviting him to visit him in his ashram. And he says, you know, I shall be, I shall be delighted to have you and your friends whenever you come. We live simply here, but we will make up for the deficiency by the natural warmth of our affection. Here is Thurman. A uh, picture with his wife in a sari. Very, she's very kind of interested in uh, exploring and playfully and enjoying Indian culture and wanting to, uh, this Indian identity kind of a thing. And uh, in this next picture, she's playing the veena. So she's very really into all this stuff. She's the one who she writes articles. She writes an article on uh, beauties of Indian civilization and articles like that in the Brack Press to raise funds so that more Africans can go to India. This is very interesting. One of the important things that Thurman wrote as a result of uh, this influence from India, his visits, meeting Gandhi and all that, uh, is this, he wrote an article, What We May Learn From India. That was a very important article in the African American Civil Rights Movement. He wrote extensively about his trip and his experiences in India. And upon meeting Gandhi, and of course Gandhi was a big influence on him, he essentially said that, you know, Gandhi took the trouble to find out all about the African American experience and uh, was very empathetic, asked, them, asked him all kinds of questions um, and was very curious to know um, the situation in America. And here's a very important quote I want to give because it's about Christians and he's a Christian leader, a very well-known person, uh, also a theologian. So he's quite established in Christianity. He says, quote, they, the Christian sects and denominations in India, are united in three important ways. First, they're all Western and white. Second, they all claim loyalty to Christ. And third, they all definitely and ostensibly endorse and cooperate with British rule. Things have changed. The Christian groups in India have sort of uh, become more Indianized. There aren't so many white uh, preachers, more Indian preachers. But they become, they've carried the colonial ideology, the ideology of the superiority of the Europeans, the ideology of the superiority of European religions. All that remains very firmly uh, in Indian Christianity, as he pointed out was the case at that time. 
so perceptive um, how Thurman was. And it's so important, Rajiv, this point that you make, that he was a minister himself, very rooted in Christianity. He never abandoned Christianity. But because he was an African-American, he could see the imperialism in the Christian mission uh, in India. You know, And he spoke out uh, very strongly against it. And here's another excerpt. The missionary and the representative of Western Christianity in India has succeeded in bringing home to the Indian one impressive fact that is that he is infinitely superior and more worthful than the Indian. He says the brutality of the Britisher seems to me to be deliberate, mature, reflective, which means he knows what he's doing, while the brutality of the American strikes me as being adolescent and immature. Even though he is suffering from the Americans, he's saying they're doing it like immature people. Whereas these Indians are getting it worse because the British are very deliberate, very cunning, very intentional, strategic in their oppression. And then there's another quote. And he says, you know, I visited a church in Jaffna, which is in Sri Lanka, at which 20 years ago there were two pulpits, one high and lifted up the other on the ground floor. From the elevated pulpit, the missionary and the missionary alone or some other European preached while from the pulpit on the floor the Indian national was permitted to preach. Once again, you know, uh, the, the segregation, the supremacy being played out even in um, the Christian churches which ostensibly were trying to uh, relieve, you know, hin Hindus and Indians of that very issue. So this article and many others he wrote are very critical of Christianity. It's very interesting that today uh, Christian missionaries have co-opted the Africans into this African uh, Afro-Dalit movement. But you know Howard Thurman, the founding father of uh, this whole civil rights movement and mentor of Martin Luther King was exactly the opposite, very critical of Christianity in India as something that have, was in uh, alliance with the oppressors, the colonizers, the invaders and holding Indians down and they were part and parcel of this whole, uh, you know, the whole colonial project. So this is quite an interesting, uh, uh, you know, contrast uh, over the last 50, 60 years because we're talking about uh, 1940s, 30s, 40s and so on and this is not, we are, now we are talking about 50, 60 years later things are so dramatically different in terms of their post the African-American posture towards us. So this is an article uh, by uh, Sue Bailey Thurman uh, in which he's saying that uh, the basic gist is that in Indian newspapers also are basically towing the British line, which surprises her. That uh, uh, such a large educated group in India, there are so many Indian newspapers, but they're towing the British line. Well, you know, things haven't changed much. We still have a lot of newspapers in India towing the colonial line. So this is an observation by an African-American visiting India and being quite appalled that they are not able to, you know, give, reverse the gaze on the British at that time. More and more African-American leaders, important people with lots of influence started visiting India and coming back and writing about India from a pro-Indian point of view, anti-British point of view. Benjamin May Mays is a very important man. He ha was a mentor to Martin Luther King also. Very influential in person, uh, academician, writer, scholar and so on. He goes to India for to do a 90-minute interview with Gandhi and comes back and writes a lot about it. And that's another kind of example of these kinds of influences. Now the camaraderie continued after India's independence. Many years, almost a decade after Gandhi died, Martin Luther King visits India to pay homage. He had not met Gandhi. And uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson visits India. They go to learn civil disobedience, Satyagraha, Gandhi's method of uh, overthrowing the rule of an oppressor without violence. Non-violent civil disobedience, a term that Gandhi used all his life. So now Reverend Martin Luther King inspired by all this stuff in India because his mentor and mentor's mentor, they had been inspired, they had met Gandhi. So now he goes to India, Reverend Jesse Jackson goes with him and India puts out, a, India has actually put out a postage stamp on Reverend Martin Luther King. 
yes. people, African Americans should know that, be very proud of that. So in this picture you see Martin Luther King being garlanded in India uh, in a traditional way. He was very warmly received. He writes this very influential article uh, called My Trip to the Land of Gandhi. He publishes in the United States. It's a huge article and inspires a whole generation of civil rights in, in the United States. And he says, at the, at the outset, let me say, we had a grand reception in India. The people showered upon us the most generous hospitality imaginable. And again, you know, he was received not just warmly, not just by the, the leadership, by the political class, but by ordinary Indians. And he writes about this extensively, one of the quotes that you just gave us. And then uh, he says, you know, we had the opportunity to share our views with thousands of Indian people through endless conversations and numerous discussion sessions. I spoke before university groups and public meetings all over India because of the keen interest that the Indian people have in the race problem. These meetings were usually Fact. Occasionally, interpreters were used, but on the whole, I spoke to audiences that understood English. So, he was quite the celebrity on his trip to India, and he was known, and he was not, uh, you know, and Indians really responded warmly. In this quotation, he says, you know, the Indian people love to listen to the Negro spirituals, therefore, Coretta ended up singing. Uh, which she was of course his wife, ended up singing as much as I lectured. And we discovered that autograph seekers are not confined to America. After appearances in public meetings and while visiting villages, we were besieged for, for autographs. Even while riding planes, more than once pilots came into the cabin from the cockpit requesting our signatures. And then here he says, um, virtually every door was open to us. We had hundreds of invitations that the limited time did not allow us to accept. We were looked upon as brothers with the color of our skin as something of an asset. But the strongest bond of fraternity and this phrase bond of fraternity uh, really defines the relationship between the two communities at this point in time was the common cause of uh, minority and colonial peoples in America, Africa and Asia struggling to throw off uh, racism and imperialism. The relations have also been uh, between the communities have also been in culture. So Paul Robeson, a very important um, uh, you know, black American icon, a cultural icon. Born here in Princeton. Born here in Princeton and there's a Robeson Road, I, sh I showed to you, we drove on that. Right. Uh, there's a Robeson, there's a, uh, the Arts Center. Mm -hmm. There's a Princeton Arts Center, which is named after him. He's a Paul local Robeson. boy. He's a local boy. So, uh, you know, he went to India, he was received by Nehru. Uh, they, they declared it a Paul Robeson Day or something in India. Uh, so he had many friends. Uh, so, particularly the Nehruvian ideological people very aligned with him. Yeah. And that's an example I could go on giving you many examples. But the point to be made is that the African American community were very close to the uh, Indian community. Well after, long before uh, India's independence, long before the Africans got their rights uh, and well into uh, uh, after India's independence. 1960s and 1960s. 70s even, yeah. In 64, the Civil Rights Act was passed which gave civil rights to people of color in the United States. A year later, a very important thing was passed in the momentum, the same momentum that the civil rights had. And this was the one that opened up immigration for Indians and other people of color. So there's all these white controls and supremacy and quotas and others are not allowed and so on were dismantled. This is in 1965, which is rather recent in American history. African Americans were the main people who shouldered this march towards this kind of a freedom. Uh, and after that, unfortunately, uh, Indians and Africans didn't sort of continue working together in the same way. Uh, lots of factors happened. There was a vacuum of, of camaraderie. Uh, Indians started coming as immigrants, mainly to get jobs, make money, 
uh, established themselves here. They were not so much politically involved. Only recently Indian, Indians in this country become politically involved and that too in, in very high circles, not with African Americans but with very high circles, both Democrat and Republican. Uh, because Indians have made a lot of money, so now they want to pull strings at a very high level. So what has happened is the relationships that have been built up over 75 years with African Americans have just sort of allowed to be atrophied and the vacuum has been taken over, filled up by breaking India forces, missionaries, Christian missionaries and they have concocted this Afro Dalit thesis which is a whole lot of humbug to convince blacks in this country that the Dalits are slaves in India and so this is, this is part of this whole school textbook problem we are having in this country. We cannot expect, uh, we, we are not getting alliance with the African Americans because they have been poisoned. They have been poisoned to think exactly against us. So this whole caste system business is playing into that. I think the Hindu leaders really need to understand this whole history that we have given here. They need to understand that it is our fault that we neglected a strategic asset and a strategic ally and it is time to come back, understand this problem, approach the African American leaders. Jesse Jackson is very open to us. Uh, uh, I've had a meeting with him and he says that they don't, they're not interested but he's very interested. So it's not just him but a whole lot of African American leaders are there that Indians should befriend, re-educate them, bring them back on track use them to fight against this Afro-Dalit project in India, the Dalitism in general because Dalitism is another western breaking India ploy to divide up Indians, divide and conquer and the Africans understand this kind of strategy. They understand that this is hurt them and this is now going to hurt India again. So we ought to think of them as allies and the, and the initiative is on our side. Absolutely and uh, we have allowed this whole relationship and all the goodwill in this relationship between these two communities to be co-opted and hijacked by breaking India forces and uh, it is sad that most Indians who live here now do not even know this history uh, which is why. Worse than that is they do not even care. Uh, it is not on the list of most important things for Indians to find out. And, and they really should be concerned because when you think about this, President Obama, the first African American president, actually opened the doors in his administration to a lot of Indians. I think the largest number of Indian Americans in the administration, in any presidential administration was during his presidency. So, um, you know, he too was, uh, you know, Obama being who he was probably was aware of some of this history. but. There's every reason for us to reclaim this relationship. Thank you. Thank you very much. This concludes our mini series on the history of Indians coming to America starting more than 200 years ago. How Indians went through hardships, all the problems and traumas they faced, the glories of their achievements as pioneers, no less than the pioneers of Europe. We saw how Indians were banned from entering the United States for many decades and how the collaboration with African Americans was very fruitful for both sides and finally in the mid 60s the doors were opened for Indians to immigrate to the United States and also become citizens. Shifali, thank you very much for all the work you have done. I want all my followers to visit her page, to visit her website janoed.com that's J A N O E D dot com. She has an incredible wealth of information. We could only sample a little bit from her website and present to you in this limited time. I think, uh, Shifali, it will be wonderful to have you back and do some more series. Good luck with your new venture. Namaste. To help me, you can go to the subscribe button on my YouTube and subscribe. We need more subscribers there. Secondly, I get lots of emails on people saying how do we donate, how can we help you. Uh, you go to rajimalhotra.com or you go to infinityfoundation.com and you can hit the donate button. If you are in a foreign country like in the US or somewhere, you can donate in dollars. There are different ways mentioned. If you want to donate in rupees, there is a column called uh, Infinity Foundation India and you click that and there are instructions on how you can donate in India.